The desire of Titus Women is to invite women around the world to know Jesus as their Savior, Center, and Source. May God guide and encourage you through this message by Beth Coppage. Numbers 20. Then the children of Israel, the whole congregation, came into the wilderness of Zin in the first month. And the people stayed in Kadesh, and Miriam died there and was buried. Now there was no water for the congregation, so they gathered together They gathered together against Moses and against Aaron. And the people contended with Moses and spoke, saying, If only we died when our brother died before the Lord. Why have you brought up the assembly of the Lord into this wilderness? And we and our animals will die here. And why have you made us come out of Egypt to bring us to this evil place? It is not a place of grain or figs or pomegranates, nor is there any water to drink. So Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the door of the congregation of the tabernacle and fell on their faces and the glory of the Lord appeared. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, take the rod, you and your brother Aaron, gather the congregation, speak to the rock before their eyes and it will yield water. Thus you shall bring water for them out of the rock and give drink to the congregation and their animals. So Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock. And he said, Hear now, you rebels, must we bring water for you out of this rock? Then Moses lifted up his eyes and he struck the rock twice with his rod. And water came out abundantly and the congregation drank. And the animals drank. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron. Because you did not believe me to hollow me, key phrase of the whole chapter, in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. This was the water of Meribah, because the children of Israel contended with the Lord, and he was hollowed among them. Now Moses sent messengers from Kadesh to the king of Edom. Thus says your brother, Israel, you know all the hardships that have befallen us. How our fathers went down to Egypt and dwelt in Egypt a long time, and the Egyptians afflicted us. When we cried out to the Lord, he heard our voice and sent the angel and brought us out of Egypt. Now here we are in Kadesh, a city on the edge of your border. Please let us pass through your country. We will not pass through fields or vineyards, nor will we drink from wells. We will go along the king's highway. We will not turn aside to the right or to the left until we have passed through your territory. And Edom said, You will not pass through my land lest I come against you with a sword. Skip down to 22. Now the children of Israel, the whole congregation, journeyed from Kadesh and came to Mount Hor. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Mount Hor by the border of Edom, Aaron shall be gathered to his people, for he shall not enter the land which I have given to the children of Israel, because you rebelled against my word. Take Aaron and Eleazar his son and bring them up on Mount Hor. And strip Aaron and his garments and put them on Eleazar. And Aaron shall be gathered to his people and die there. So Moses did just as the Lord commanded and they went up on the mountain in the sight of all the congregation. Moses stripped Aaron of his garments and put them on Eleazar, and Aaron died on the top of the mount. Then Moses and Eleazar came down. Now when all the congregation saw that Aaron was dead, all the house of the Lord mourned for Aaron thirty days. Now King Arad, the Canaanite who dwells in the south, heard that Israel was coming up the road to Atherim. Then he fought against Israel and took some of them prisoners. So Israel made a vow to the Lord. And if you will indeed deliver this people, I will utterly destroy them. And the Lord listened to the voice of Israel and delivered up the Canaanites, and they utterly destroyed them from their cities. So the name of the place was called Hormah. Then they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the soul of the people became very discouraged on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. 
Once again, why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There's no food and no water, and we hate this manna. So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people. And many of the people of Israel died there. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned. We have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he will send the serpents away from us. So Moses prayed. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And it shall be that everyone, shall, everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent. He put it on a pole. And it, so it was, if a serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. And I'd like to read three verses from John 3, 14, 15, and 16. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus, you're here. Would you come? And would you transform our lives? Would you just open up Holy Scripture today? Would you begin in my own heart? Oh, Lord Jesus, would you set us on fire as women? And would you let the world be different because we have lived? Would you let the generations be different? Would you come this morning in these next few minutes? Would you turn our lives inside up, inside out, and our hearts absolutely upright side up so that we're all yours? 150% never to go back. In Jesus' name, amen. Chapter 19 of Numbers is all about the rite of purification. The whole chapter, before we go into the next couple chapters, is all about what it means if there's death in the camp and how to get your heart purified. And a heifer was to be taken outside the camp and killed and burned and then his ashes were to be taken and mixed with water and and while the ash the heifer is being burned they were to throw in scarlet and hyssop and cedar wood then these ashes were to be taken with living water living water symbolic of Jesus the living water and then to apply to anyone that had been contaminated by death and the priest was to come, or the clean one was to come and to cover them with the altar and uh, the, the living water and the ashes. And for seven days, they were to have a, a, a be outside the camp, bathing on the third day, and then on the seventh before they were caught, be declared clean. So chapter 19, once again, reiterates that there's a purification available for the people of God if they will choose it. But they can choose to live having contaminated themselves with death, which is symbolic over and over again in Scripture with sin. They can live being contaminated, but provision has been made, even in the Old Testament, provision has been made for the purification of the people of God. And then, in the contrast of that, we have chapter 20. And once again, we have this is a very hard chapter emotionally on the man Moses. It is a very difficult chapter. It is the 40th year of the wilderness wanderings. It is the last year. It is the beginning of the end and the beginning of the beginning. And the book of Numbers in Hebrew, the world, word is for the book of Numbers, wilderness. And so what we have here is it begins in chapter 20 where it says the children of Israel came into the wilderness of Zin and Miriam died when they got to Kadesh. So one of the strong leaders in the camp has died, Miriam. In the backdrop of that, and the grief of that to Moses and Aaron, the people of God are not very sensitive. There's once again not much water. 
They're in the wilderness of Zin. I mean, it's just the, the desert, the, the Sinai desert. And there they are. They bury Miriam. And the people, once again, there's no water. So even though these two brothers are in grief, they, they wail against them. And they contend with them. And say, if only we died in the wilderness. And if only we had just never left Egypt. And why has the Lord brought us here? And why, I don't see any pomegranates or grain or fine fruits. You have deceived us, Moses. Now, these are not the, 40, the people that have died. These are the children of the people who lost their lives because they failed to believe God. And what strikes me with, uh, with almost horror is like begets like. And what else strikes me is that time does not make you and I better. So what we see here is do they not sound exactly like their mamas and their papas who had spent the 40 years paying for their sin? They sound exactly the same. Had they learned anything? Doesn't look like it. And do you know what? You and I can fool ourselves. And you and I can say, well, I want my kids not to get into the horrors of drugs or alcohol or pornography and the, uh, the impact of that, I don't want any of them in jail. I want them to live nice Christian lives and to enjoy the benefits of the gospel. And every one of us here wants that. But when it comes down to what it cost for that to become a reality in the life of your children and my children, which means you and I have to die to our own self-will and our own selfishness and our own contentious spirits and our own putting the blame on someone else so that we are never happy, it is always someone else's fault, and I am never getting a fair deal, and I am never getting a fair shake, like begets like, only we weep, uh, reap a wind, and in the next generation we reap a whirlwind. And it is a law of life that you and I cannot expect to come out of our progeny, that that we do not allow God to do in us. And I want to know today, and I want to know it in you and in me, what is in your heart and in my heart? Have we died to our selfishness and our self-will? Now this not only hits we be like, begets like, but also in our coping mechanisms, our defense mechanisms, our fears that we don't bring to Jesus. There's purification and healing available in Jesus. The whole chapter before says it. But we don't bring to him the needs of our inner person so that even those generational sins go on and God says they don't need to go on. It can be stopped if you and I will pay the price to let God do it in our own hearts. Remember my story when we got back from being overseas for seven years and I never was a great driver and then I was four years in Latin America and two years in England and I didn't drive? And I got home and I had to drive and it was like, ah, I just was scared to death. And so we lived in Massachusetts, in Quincy, Massachusetts, which was tons of traffic, 20 minutes away from the nearest grocery store, 40 minutes away from our church and Bible study. And I kept saying, Al, you've got to take me. I just can't drive. I'm too afraid. He said, you have got to learn to drive. I can't just carry you all around. I have to go to work. Oh, I just cried. I wailed. I said, you're not very loving. You're not very kind. If you loved me, you would. And he just went, oh. So then I begin to drive, and I get in the car, and I would go, okay. And Katie, Beth, and Cricket were little. I said, okay. Pray. Let's pray. <laughs> so Katie, Ben, and Cricket just pray. They were like three and four. They pray, and I pray. We'd all pray. And we'd get there, and then we'd get there, you know, and just tear. Just tear. Well, one day, I had made it to Bible study. We were on our way home in all this traffic, and we get in the car. Little Cricket is three. We didn't seatbelt him in, if you can believe it back there. They didn't even have it. That really dates me. 
she turns around and kneels on the back of the seat and goes, Oh, Jesus, help mommy, help mommy, help mommy. She's got to drive, help mommy. And I thought, ah, I am making my two children neurotic because of my sin. I said, God, help me. You have got to heal this in my life. I can't pass this generational bondage down to them. They don't deserve that. And that was a wake-up call. That little girl in the back seat just crying out for God to help her mother instead of letting me take hold of the purposes and the beauty of Jesus. And I remember in that very same Bible study, about the next week, praise Jesus, he's so faithful, the little lady said, God can give you a new name. And then she had the audacity to go around in the circle and say, what would yours be? I thought, oh. By faith. And he touched me. He touched me. Now I sure wasn't ready for the the races. But do you know what? I've been back and forth to Florida. Going to New York. There's no fear there anymore. If he calls, he will enable me. Perfect love casts out fear. God doesn't want our generational sin or our willful self-will sin to go on. He wants to cut it. There's all the provision in the world in Jesus for it to be stopped. If we will appropriate his grace. Then the next thing we have, they've, you may be walking with God in the fullness of his spirit appropriating everything he has for you that you know at this point in your life. But I bet if my if life is like it is for you, it is for, for all of us, there is someone in your life that is contentious and cantankerous as the Israelites were. And at every point they can someone who doesn't know him who's lost or someone who's not living in the fullness of the spirit in themselves so that whatever happens in life it's your fault whatever happens in life it's it's not quite right they are never happy they are always looking for another day God's never given them a fair shake And it's always, if there's any point to blame, somehow you caused it, even though you may not even have been around when it happened. And what Moses and Aaron, for 40 years, have lived with that. And it's always their fault. Theirs and God's. And over and over again, what do they do? with that contentious, bickering, unhappy people. They left the presence of the people. This is verse 6. They went to the door of the tabernacle. It says they didn't even get into the tabernacle, and they fall prostrate on their face. They go to God, and they go to God until the glory comes. (laughs) And then they go to God, prostrate on their face in the tabernacle until the glory comes, till God meets them with his sweet presence and his love for them and his acceptance for them and his confirmation of what they're doing, that they are in the will of God, even though all the people around them are saying they're not in the will of God. And then... His glory comes and meets them personally with himself. I love that. The glory comes. Then he gives them a plan. Just like Deborah. He gives them a Deborah plan. This is how you meet this situation with these contentious people. Isn't he sweet? And, and so they wait upon him. They let him heal their hurts. Now, and then, then he says, take a rod. Take your brother, gather the congregation, speak to the rock before their eyes, and it will yield the increase. It will yield water, not only for the people, but also for the animals. Now, the thing is, I think, 
Moses is under incredible emotional stress. His, his sisters died. He's weary. He's been listening to complain for 40 years. Pardon me, he's up to here. His stress level is up to here. And he, the glory came, but I don't think he waited quite long enough. And I think God says, don't hit the rock, Moses, because he knew if he hit it, he was just going to keep on. <laughs> you know. So what does he say? Speak to the rock. Speak to it. Speak to it. So they know it doesn't come from you, but it comes from me. And the needs are met in me, not in you. You are not big enough to meet anyone's needs. That's why you and I have to always draw people to Jesus. There's nothing in you, nothing in me that can meet the needs of the human condition. We can't meet our own. It's only in him. So honor me before them. Speak to the rock. But Moses is exasperated. And Moses takes it and he loses his cool. And he takes that and he goes, Here now, you rebels. He's never said that before. Must we bring water for you out of this rock? <laughs> and Moses lifted up his hand and he struck that rock twice. And God sent the water abundantly. And it even says how abundantly. He had enough over for the animals. God's so kind. But then he talks to him and he says, Moses, he said, because you did not believe me and hollow me, or the word in Hebrew is sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel. Therefore, you will not go into the promised land. Because in that moment of stress and in that moment of crisis, which was an opportunity once again of death to self and once again dying that Jesus might be lived out before them. He fails, he moves in the flesh instead of the spirit and in response to stress he just does it in his own strength and the Father is not glorified or hallowed. And he, you and I are supposed to be examples of what it means to walk with a holy God. And so that people can look at us, even contentious, difficult, bickering, unhappy, backslidden, or lost people, and see Jesus in our lives. And you may think, and I may think, well, it's just one time, and nobody's perfect, and it doesn't really matter, and we just need to let loose every once in a while but you and I cannot sin even once in a while that the consequences are not of utmost severity and do not bring dire consequences and we have to live with those consequences even if we didn't mean to and we were under incredible stress like the preacher that preached a tremendous revival in one town in North Carolina and God mightily moved and then he went into the next town to preach and they flocked, were flocking to hear him and the sound equipment and the mechanics of the thing didn't work and he just let loose and bawled out the people that were helping him with the sound equipment and his ministry was absolutely dead. And you say, well, it's not fair. He'd been preaching, he was tired, he was this, he was that. no. But it says the consequences and the devil loves to do that. So that you and I need to guard our hearts. And that when we're under stress, we need to come to Jesus and sit in his presence and leave the situation we're in. Whether you've come from an abusive background and that baby's ready, so you're just ready. Leave that baby. Leave that child. And you go in the next room and sit until the glory comes. And you can get up and speak. And, not, and be at peace and trust Jesus to work. We cannot underestimate the power of sin and that God wants may has made every provision for you and I not to sin if we will appropriate it. Even in our responses, Jesus is so good. And we have an example of that this morning. Even in our prayer request. Do you not imagine that it was just, and what we do with our stress relief, we cannot go into sin in our stress relief. Well, I just playing on the computer a little bit. And, and well, my husband's not quite meeting my needs. And this guy sounds so good and, and nothing will ever come of it. 
Well, you just wonder what happened in the off moments for the man that hurt Lucy. Was it not pornography worked out to the natural result? You and I have to guard our hearts in stressful times. And Moses had to pay the consequences of his stress level. And he had to pay for it. And he, he was broken. So God can forgive us. But there are some things even God cannot undo. That's why Jesus' blood comes to set us free. He comes to set us free. And then sometimes you and I end up in the wilderness because we make choices. And our choices are such that we don't ask God what his will is. We just do it. And then we get into a pickle and we say, why'd you put me here? And he said, I didn't have anything to do with it. You put yourself there and now you're in the consequences of your choices and you're mad at me. Remember the little gal that was raised in a Christian home, loved Jesus and went to university? She was bright. And she went to law school. She was good. She became a real good executive corporate lawyer. And she never realized she lost Jesus. She never took him to university, never took him to law school, never took him to a law practice. One day fell in love with a divorced fellow lawyer. They got married. And she found he was an alcoholic at home and incredibly abusive. And her world was shattered. And she looked up and she said, God, why did you do this to me? He said, pardon me. I didn't do that to you. You did it to yourself. It is what you chose. You never asked me the first time. God is saying today, seek me. Don't walk in disobedience. Even when the stress is on, seek my face and wait until the glory comes and meets you. Now, this is a very little thing. <clears throat> but it wasn't too long ago that something happened that hurt me very deeply. You know how life does in the wear and tear of it? And I was just, I was crushed. And I did, and, um, and I was complaining, saying, why and if only. And all of a sudden, because of studying numbers, I thought, aha, these do not sound like things that are supposed to be being said. So I sat in my little prayer chair and I said, Jesus, I can't handle this hurt. And I will sin against you. I'm already starting that way. It's so insidious. Please, would you keep me from sin? I give you the hurt. I give you the pain. I give you what I feel is the injustice of it. Lord, I give it to you. And would you give me your responses in spite of me? Now, this is, this is somebody, I've known him. I've been saved. I've been filled with the Spirit. But boy, my first response is gut level. We're just like Israel's. And then I said, Lord, I can't even think about it anymore. I give it to you. So I like had a little basket, and I put it in the basket and put it up <laughs> to give it to him. Do you know what? I woke up the next morning, and at three and I awake, and he whispers to you, the first thing was, bless. And it was this person. Bless him, bless him, bless him, all these. And I lay there with this, and all of a sudden, I started to giggle before I got out of bed. I said, Jesus, 
that is your response, not mine. You have heard my prayer. I said, that is amazing. And so I didn't have to pray. I just, and it was not forced. It was him praying through me, praying for me, and praying in spite of me to guard my heart. Now, I'm just a beginner here. But I believe there's so much more God wants to do in us that he wants to move us into a realm whether we have just known him or we're just beginning our walk. Or in this case, Moses had seen him almost face to face and still under the pressure of stress, he blew it. God says, don't. Then more pressure comes. They go to eat him and their cousins won't let him go through. And they're sad. 30 miles they could cross over to where they need to make a point to go up into the promised land. They said, no way, Jose. So here Moses has the stress, then more stress, the death of Aaron. And what you have in the death of Aaron is a very great grief to Moses, but there's no sense of grief in the story. It's like he has come to a place back again to such submission to the will of the Father it is all right. And in Aaron, what you have is the transformation from Aaron's life to Eliezer's life. And they go up to Mount Hor. And he that takes off the vestiges of the priesthood, puts it on his son. And there is a transition from one generation to another in the presence of God and in the presence of Moses and the priesthood of God goes on. And oh, women today, that's what God wants to do, that there will be the transition from your life to the generation to come to the generation to come, that there'll be a transition from my mom and my grandmom and to me that will go to my kids, that will go to the generations that are already starting to come. We're in the fifth generation of one person who chose to walk with God. And it is the transition from one generation to another of the presence and power of Jesus. But we cannot transition if we do not know him and we are not clean. And do you know what happened? I read just before going on my retreat of Catherine Booth, the mother of the Salvation Army. She had eight children, and she and William began preaching in the slums of London and God birthed the Salvation Army. She lived in incredible physical weakness. Many times she would go and share Jesus and come back and be in bed for days. She died at 62 of breast cancer. She would be so nauseated sometimes. She would work with penitents at the altar, go and th throw up, clean up, and come back and continue to work. When she died, she had lived through rejection and pain, but what had been birthed as a Salvation Army to this day is the leading charitable institution around the globe. She lived with constant pain, constant rejection. Well, she went to heaven. 30,000 people were at her funeral. It was not in vain. Went to heaven. And her daughter, Emma, was in the Salvation Army with her husband. They were sharing Jesus. And she had her first baby and got very sick and was getting ready to die. And she said, I think it's just a little too hard. I want to just give up. And go to heaven and she had a dream and in her dream Catherine came and she came not sickly not with vestiges of cancer or tuberculosis but she came with a resurrected body to her daughter and she said Emma live 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 and share Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. The moments on earth are only moments. It is all worthwhile. And Emma got up from that deathbed and went with the torch of Jesus into the next generation, and we know the results. God's the same. It is costly to go forward with him but it is much more costly and deadly not to go and to live in the wilderness and lose the souls 
of your soul and the souls of all you love. Because life is hard. It's which pain are you going to choose? The costliness of going with God or the costliness of not? And then we have the Canaanites come out and fight him. And for once, they destroy them. And they respond in obedience. But then as soon as they have that victory, the double-minded Israelites, as soon as they have to go around that long journey, instead of going into Edom, do you know what happens? They complain again. And God just sends fiery serpents. And the serpents bite them and begin to kill them. And as their pain, they cry out. And Mo- God tells Moses, make a fiery serpent and lift it up on a pole. And any one key phrase that chooses to look at it will be redeemed and saved and healed. But they had to choose. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so in the New Testament, Jesus was lifted up. And anyone that is willing to choose can choose Jesus and can know purity of heart, purity of life, and freedom from sin. I'd like to close with the story of we have no idea of what it cost Jesus and what it cost the Father to send Jesus. But when Hudson Taylor in the 1800s was called to go to China, His mother put him on the boat. His daddy had already died. She took him to Liverpool and put him on the boat. And um, she got his little room all ready that he would be in for six months. They prayed together. They sang a hymn. And then the call came that she had to leave. So she tried not to cry. And so to be strong for Hudson who was getting ready to go to China. As he watched, as he watched his mama walk along the the wharf, as the boat began to pull out of the harbor on its way to China from Liverpool. And then he saw his mama at the end of the wharf, and as the boat pulled out into the strong ocean he heard a cry from the depths of her being because she knew that apart from a miracle she would never see him again in this world and he said in that moment I got a glimmer of what it caused God to send his son to redeem us as my mother put me on that boat to go to interior China for Jesus and the agony of soul at the separation but the willingness to say yes to God. It is costly but it is worthwhile. Church of Jesus was started in China that still goes on today and when he died 125,000 Chinese knew God I want to know today where are we what are we passing on to our progeny are we right with him is our life costly but is costly that leads to redemption and evangelization of the world or is it costly because I have disobeyed him and made my own choices and am now living in the results of sinful choices. We don't have to live there. Purification is available. For God so loved the world that he gave his son.